Testing one, two, three, four. Jeremy Bernstein, tape, November 27, side A. Born July 26, 1928. New York City. Stanley Kubrick is a director who famously took great attention to detail in all of his films. His elaborate uses of mise-en-scene almost transform his environments into their own characters with stories to tell. With this video essay, I'd like to focus specifically on one recurring detail that I noticed Kubrick likes to use, the color red. To understand Kubrick's use of red, we must first adopt a color consciousness. The term was coined by Natalie Kalmus, a woman who was the executive head of the Technicolor Art Department and credited as the color consultant of all Technicolor films produced from 1934 to 1949. Kalmus believed that colors have their own psychological implications. A color like green can mean nature, the outdoors, freedom, or freshness, and say, red, the color we're focusing on in this video, can represent danger, violence, or revenge, but it can also mean love, passion, or desire. To understand character personalities and harmonize their emotions to their situations, these recurring principles must apply, even to the extent of what she called a color juxtaposition, or the psychological relation one color has to another. With our newfound consciousness of what red might mean, we'll explore Kubrick's multi-layered use of it through three of his films, The Shining, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Eyes Wide Shut. What's curious about Kubrick's work is his deliberate use of red imagery. From the tidal wave of blood in The Shining to Hal's eerie red eye in A Space Odyssey, there seems to be an importance to its implementation. But where is this derived from? To answer that, let's look at one of the opening scenes of The Shining. When Jack first goes to the Overlook Hotel, he's being interviewed for the winter caretaker position. The color palette of the room is fairly bland. The salmon walls and the brown furniture don't draw too much attention to the eye. The only noticeable object in the room is a bright red book lying on Ullman's desk. This is quite strange. What's up with this red book? Well, if one zooms into the frame, the book's title is clearly named The Red Book. This may seem innocuous at first, but those who know Kubrick's work are aware that the smallest details can have the largest implications. This red book is actually the masterpiece of Swiss psychologist Carl Jung, in which he details his work with the unconscious psyche. The color red is a deliberate metaphor to the way Jung frames his theories. Red images, as I mentioned before, can portray passion, sexuality, anger, death, violence, or revolution. The color is also used in representations of birth and rebirth. Similar to the use of red found in records of early rituals and myths, it's also used as a threshold between reality and fantasy. According to Jung, the dualistic nature of red can indicate a portal between the literal or symbolic realms of life and death. If Jung considered color as archetypal aspects within the psyche, then red in particular, with its associations as a threshold between life and death, may be the bridge that connects the conscious and unconscious realms. The struggle between the conscious and unconscious mind within the psyche of the individual is a central theme to many of Kubrick's films. With this in mind, it's impossible to deny Kubrick's connection to Jung's work. Now that we've established a clear connection, I will interpret Kubrick's use of red through a Jungian perspective. The Shining is Kubrick's adaptation of a Stephen King novel by the same name. It follows the story of Jack, a writer that is hired to be the winter caretaker of the isolated Overlook Hotel. He settles in along with his wife Wendy and his son Danny, who is plagued by psychic premonitions. As Jack's writing goes nowhere and Danny's visions become more and more disturbing, 
Jack begins to unravel into a homicidal maniac, hell-bent on murdering his family. The man we see initially is sufficiently versed at presenting himself as a dependable employee and aspiring writer. Soon, however, we witness his propensity for using repression, denial, rationalization, and projection as buffers against self-awareness. What's central to The Shining is Jack's fall into madness. Jack's descent mirrors the Jungian theory of the shadow self. According to Jung, the shadow self is supposedly the unconscious side of one's psyche that the conscious side suppresses. It's the dark side of ourselves that we shelter from everyone else. Jung believed that understanding and accepting our shadow selves, rather than letting them fester inside, was the key to finding oneself. In The Shining, we instead see Jack's shadow self completely take over him. This possession is illustrated through Kubrick's placement of the color red. As Jack loses himself to the ethereal powers of the hotel, red becomes more and more apparent around him. In the beginning, Jack is mostly in browns, but in the moments where he is alone and communicating with the unconscious forces of the hotel, he and the environment around him starts to fill with red. The first time Jack wears red, he's screaming from a horrible nightmare he had after falling asleep writing. This is the shadow, or unconscious self, making its first attempt at taking over Jack. What well, I dreamed that I, that I killed you with Danny. Danny walks in with a wound on his neck, and Wendy jumps to the conclusion that it must have been Jack's doing. This leaves Jack to his own devices. After this, Jack goes to the hotel bar. Here, a phantom bartender named Lloyd, who is also wearing red, appears before him. Lloyd, a projection of Jack's unconscious, pushes Jack to talk about his troubles. As Jack drinks, he rationalizes that his troubles are being caused by Wendy. I never laid a hand on him, goddammit. I didn't. But that bitch. As long as I live, she'll never let me forget what happened. Red makes its true debut at the tipping point of Jack's mind. When he comes back to the bar after visiting room 237, which by the way has a red room tag attached to it, he is invited to the bathroom behind the bar. The red in the scene could not be more explicit. The walls of the bathroom are almost uncomfortably covered in red. The visual representation of Jack's unconscious winning over him is astounding. Here, Jack talks to the former caretaker of the Overlook Hotel, Mr. Grady. As their conversation ensues, Mr. Grady eerily talks to Jack and convinces him that his wife and son are interfering with the important work that needs to be done, and perhaps he should correct them. Perhaps they need a good talking to, if you don't mind my saying so. Perhaps a bit more. This is the moment where Jack loses to his shadow. The moment activates Danny's final vision, and he screams, Red run! Red run! Danny, what's the matter, hon? Red run! Which is murder, backwards. From this point on, Jack is fully taken by his lust for death, and wears red for the rest of the film. As opposed to Wendy, who wears all blue. The fact that red is absent with Wendy indicates that at this moment, she's living in her conscious self, unlike Jack. Out of the three movies I watched, 2001 A Space Odyssey was the strangest. The film takes place in outer space, but its real setting is the inner space of our psyche. Through incredible symbolism and visualization, Kubrick takes us on a voyage of self-discovery to find out what it really means to be human. In order to frame how Kubrick's red represents our unconscious, we must first dig deeper into the heart of the film. In the very first scene, we see a black monolith buried deep in the sand that is discovered by our ancient primitive ancestors. Like the fear of our unfamiliar unconscious, 
The primitive humans fearfully approach the monolith and touch it hesitantly, not really grasping its essence. The monolith, aligned with the sun pointing upwards, inspires the primitive humans with their first creation, a bone that they use as a tool and then as a weapon. This is a discovery of opposites, of good and evil that according to Jung, we all possess. Not all the things we make are good and empower advancement. Some of the things we make are embedded in warfare and aggression that can ultimately lead to destruction. This same tool that leads to this aggression is then thrown up to the heavens by the primates, only for it to become the spaceship that will further our exploration into the inner space psyche. And so, the Odyssey continues. The rest of the film is then centered around a mission to Jupiter, where a similar monolith is discovered floating nearby the planet. With a new tool on humanity's side, the supercomputer HAL 9000, they'll be able to figure out what the monolith is. And here is where the film expresses the error of human nature. It's the reliance on technology and science to figure everything out and to tell us who we are, to be the all good and powerful God. Let me put it this way, Mr. Amer. The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. No 9000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. We are all, by any practical definition of the words, foolproof and incapable of error. Mysticism, spirituality, and instinct are dead for this new modern human. Logic is now the mother image that humans look to for guidance. What is still feared, though, is the unknown, or the unconscious and its magical influence. The color red in the film represents that threshold between the known and unknown. Kubrick mainly puts his reds with technology. The flight bays in the space station, the landing station on Clavius, and the interior of the HAL 9000 computer, as well as his hypnotic, glossy, and mysterious iris. It's also the color of Bowman's spacesuit, more literal representation of red being the bridge between the known, the oxygen-rich safety of the suit, and the unknown, represented by the vast vacuum of space. For this video essay though, I want to mainly focus on Hal, the antagonist of the film. While on the journey to Jupiter, Hal detects a problem with the ship's antenna and sends the crew to investigate. Strangely, Mission Control reports back that its twin 9000 computer says that the unit is just fine, and it's actually Hal that's wrong. This unsettling news strikes fear into our characters, and is where Red makes its true debut in the film. Poole and Bowman use an excuse to go to the Eva pod, and they secretly discuss what to do with Hal. In this scene, the pod is bathed in red light. They've now occupied an unconscious space of unknowing. Well, what do you think? I'm not sure, what do you think? I've got a bad feeling about him. You do? Yeah, definitely. Don't you? No, I think so. You know, of course, though, he's right about the 9000 series having a perfect operational record. They do. Their all-knowing technological god may not be as omnipotent as they thought, and the red conveys that. If Hal is wrong as they suspect, they'll have to shut down his higher brain functions. Hal, watching from the outside of the pod with his red eye, discovers their plan by reading their lips. This sends Hal into a murderous rampage to protect the mission from these incompetent humans. The unconscious is now unleashed as ambition, greed, paranoia, control, and aggression take over Hal as he kills the astronauts and sabotages the mission of self-discovery. In the end, Hal, the airless computer, turns the destroyer. Hal is the unconscious is void of conscious intuition in a time where only logic and science is God. Being right is now more important than anything. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. Jung's shadow archetype is embodied by Hal, but also by us as its creator. The fact that we could possibly create a tool of our own destruction is becoming harder not to see, especially when faced with a mirror-like monitor face of ourselves. Awareness is one thing, but seeing the false god images for what they really are is much more difficult. Turning off the noise from the outside that distracts us from seeing within takes time. 
This is when Bowman, the only astronaut left, goes into Hal's central core to disconnect him. The room is intensely red because we are now at the heart of the film's unconscious. Bit by bit, switch by switch, we look on as Bowman struggles in his mental conflict to shut down Hal. It's painful to watch as the simulated human voice of Hal pleads like a wounded child for us not to leave it behind, to give it another chance. Will you stop, Dave? Stop, Dave. As Bowman proceeds with shutting Hal down, he lets go of the technological god that humanity has depended on for so long as being the way to fulfillment and wholeness. It takes courage to admit that we have good and evil inside us, as well as accepting that what we create can be a vessel for evil. But according to Jung, accepting that is the essential step to gaining wholeness. After Bowman shuts Hal down, he's freed from the clutches of the unconscious and continues his journey to the monolith. Now that the unconscious that Hal represents has been destroyed, a journey of rebirth takes place. Instead of hesitantly approaching the monolith with the same fear our ancestors had before, Bowman takes a leap of faith and enters it. The film now focuses on Bowman's eyes as he's projected into an interdimensional portal. The isolated red is now abandoned as the portal is entirely full of uncontained colors. Bowman has abandoned his need for an unconscious god and has now entered entirely with all the incorporated shadows and mysteries of the unconscious and conscious self. Bowman is now transported from his ship to an old French decorated room. There, he is looking at himself from outside of himself. This is where the past and present meets the future and merges together into a rebirth of newness. In the next instant, Bowman attains wholeness. In a most moving and powerful ending scene, we see the result of Bowman's transcendence between the conscious and unconscious as a baby, floating in space with his eyes wide open, bright and new. He gazes upon the earth from above, now as a part of the universe. And so the Jungian individuation process has been realized. By facing, destroying, and transcending beyond the red unconscious, our journey through the inner space of our psyche is complete. Eyes Wide Shut was Kubrick's very last movie. The film follows the sexually charged adventures of Dr. Bill Harford, who is shocked when his wife, Alice, reveals that she had contemplated having an affair a year earlier. He then embarks on a night-long adventure, during which he infiltrates a masked orgy of an unnamed secret society. Throughout the movie, Bill is wrapped up in his own inner world of lust and jealousy. He lives his life in a dreamlike state, whereas Alice seems to have an easier time distinguishing between reality and fantasy. The way red is used creates a bridge between reality and fantasy, especially with its juxtaposition to the color blue. Much like red and blue being representations of the conscious and unconscious mind in The Shining, the struggle between Bill's compulsion to cheat or to give in to his shadow self is represented by red, while his loyalty to his wife is represented by blue. The blue and red struggle essentially starts when Bill and Alice have their argument after smoking a joint. Alice lays on a red bed and Bill sits beside her, his head framed by the blue bathroom window. Once Alice starts telling Bill that all women have sexual desires outside of their relationships, she leaves the bed and sits under the blue window. Bill moves to solely occupy the red bed. She then reveals her sexual fantasy of being with a sailor, which throughout the film is represented as a blue vision in Bill's head. He fails to appreciate the fact that Alice was honest with him and ultimately loyal. I was ready to give up everything. You. the next
this morning in a panic. I didn't know whether I was afraid that he had left or that he might still be there. Dinner, I realized he was gone. And I was Meanwhile, Bill himself lies to Alice during the argument. The central conflict of the film is now set. Later in the film, Bill is walking down the street, lost in jealous blue thoughts of Alice and the sailor. We follow a tracking shot of Bill as he's bombarded with blue and red, both canceling each other out. He's conflicted. Note that Bill walks by a bright blue door. While waiting to cross the street, a neon sign in the background reads XXX Video. The exact moment Bill's head is directly under the red XXX, a prostitute named Domino approaches him. She flirts with him until they stand in front of her apartment building, which is, of course, adorned with a big, bright red door. He goes in with her as he's tempted by his lust. In the apartment, Bill and Domino begin to kiss. Their profiles fill the frame with the exception of two little Christmas lights, one red and one blue. The kissing is interrupted by Alice calling Bill's cell phone wondering when he's going to come home. Her cutaway shot is bathed in blue. Bill ends the encounter and leaves. The relationship between red and blue in this example is clear. They're positioned according to Bill's state of mind. When Bill is tempted into giving into his shadow, red is present in the frame. When he is conflicted, blue dances alongside it in a visual struggle over Bill's conscious self. Then, as the film progresses and he becomes more and more intoxicated with living as his unconscious side, red is ever more present. We see this at one of the apexes of the film, the secret orgy scene. Here, Bill's desires are fully embodied by the secret society he curiously infiltrates. After learning of the unfaithful fantasies of his wife after a party at the penthouse of his friend, he seeks for sexual fulfillment in the streets of New York City and finds out about the secret orgy via another friend. He enters the establishment with a mask and finds himself surrounded by other masked people. This is where Red Cloak, the leader of the cult and presumed antagonist of the story, is introduced. We never find out his true identity though. He is an enigmatic and powerful figure who rules over the rest of the cult. If our interpretation of Red is correct, Red Cloak is Bill's fully embodied unconscious shadow self. The faceless phantom-like being stands in the middle of the red carpeted room, surrounded by other members, yet is the only one wearing red. His facelessness seals this figure as the shadow, an unknown being with an unknown potential that tempts Bill into a lustful fantasy he's been struggling with. While the red cloak eventually banishes Bill from the event, his introduction to the other side pushes Bill into a journey of self-discovery by flirting with temptation. The road ahead is marked with accents of red during these key scenes. Reaching the end of the movie, Bill comes home from his escapades and confesses to Alice about what he's done. He enters the bedroom where Alice is sleeping, and the room is noticeably bathed in blue. After his fantasy-like journey, he comes back to reality and feels the weighted guilt of betraying his wife, breaking down in the process. The confession is cathartic in a way that brings them together. Uncertain on how to move on with real life after venturing in dreamland, Alice expresses that they should be grateful for surviving their fantasies, whether they were real or only imagined. Maybe I think we should be grateful. Grateful that we've managed to survive through all of our adventures, whether they were real or only a dream. Bill points out that no dream is ever just a dream. The joint conclusion they reach brings together the two worlds the movie has been analyzing from the start and shows fantasy and reality as two faces of the same coin. 
The act that may follow a desire bears no weight on the scale of a relationship. The sheer presence of it is enough to throw it off balance. The blue mood lighting in the scene is what brings them back together. The red unconscious forces that tempted them into adultery have now been resolved through their honesty to each other and more importantly, their honesty to themselves. The reds used in the three films I've just analyzed all paint a similar Jungian picture. The struggle between the conscious and unconscious is the primordial force that moves and completes these films. The archetypes differ from film to film though. The Shining's unconscious is the hotel that brings out the murderous killer inside of Jack. 2001's is the technology that humans put their trust in. And in Eyes Wide Shut, the lustful temptations and dreamlike states are what define its unconscious. What's fascinating about the way Kubrick conveys this theme is that it's not entirely through narration and dialogue, but through its carefully constructed cinematography and his attention to small details, like the color red. Throughout this video, I've placed various quotes regarding my topic, but to end it, I'd like to read you this particular quote from Kubrick that I think encapsulates the way he makes his movies and justifies his reds as potential vessels for meaning. If you really want to communicate something, even if it's just an emotion or an attitude, let alone an idea, the least effective and least enjoyable way is directly. It only goes in about an inch, but if you can get people to the point where they have to think a moment what it is you're getting at and then discover it, the thrill of discovery goes right through the heart. Kubrick doesn't want his audience simply peering at the surface of his works. A character in their dialogue has its place but he wants us to dig deeper into the heart and soul of his films. He wants us to uncover, to learn, and to reflect. The thrill of uncovering these hidden Jungian interpretations through a simple color and reflecting on the messages embedded in his films has all in all been an enlightening experience. I hope this video was as entertaining and informative as it was hard to make. Thank you for listening and have a great day.